and I'm welcome back to another A21 Biology Revision video, guys. Today we're going to be finishing off immunity and talking about antibiotics, ladies and gentlemen. And let's waste no time, let's get straight into it, because antibiotics can be a little bit of a longer topic. Now, let's just start off by giving you a simple introduction. So, antibiotics are substances that are produced by microorganisms that act against bacteria. They do not include antimicrobial substances that are synthetic or come from animals and plants. So, antibiotics are produced by the microorganism. My antimicrobial substances are synthetic, okay? So, you, you need to know what they're. So, an antimicrobial will include an agent that acts against all types of microorganisms, such as bacteria, viruses, fungi, and malaria. But it's an antibiotic, it's just against bacteria. Antibiotics that treat bacterial diseases include penicillin, which prevents the production of a, of a bacterial cell wall and therefore cells absorb water, they burst when they die. It is a bacterial antibiotic. You also have tetracycline, which binds to the bacterial ribosomes and inhibit protein synthesis. They are bacteriostatic as they prevent bacteria from reproducing. So let's talk a little bit about antibiotic resistance then. So the development of anti antibiotic resistance is that antibiotics have become less effective as the bacteria have developed an antibiotic resistance. This is when bacteria, this is when few bacteria have, have possessed alleys that are coded for in a way that prevents the effect of the antibiotic. And the widespread use means that the resistant bacteria will survive and reproduce and so the resistance strain will predominate. Essentially bacteria will develop a mutation that allows it the antibiotic not to work against it and therefore they will survive and, and reproduce and predominate. So how do you reduce the risk of antibiotic resistance? Well, you can only use antibiotics when they're necessary. The person who prescribed the antibiotics will complete their course and this will increase the chances of eradicating all disease causing bacteria. Hospitals will also have to take great care not to spread bacteria by having strict hygiene regulations such as the use of bacterial cytokine hand gels and have consideration to use more than one antibiotic to treat a disease as it's unlikely one bacterium will possess two different resistance alleles. The consequences though of, of antibiotic resistance if it occurs is that you may contain MRSA or C. diff. Uh, both have caused deaths in hospital patients. MRSA and C. diff cases have decreased however as strict hygiene controls in hospitals. But what has increased in frequency is sepsis and is becoming a common cause of death. So let's get back to this thing called an antimicrobial then. So antimicrobials are in plants. So, they, so an antimicrobial can actually be produced by a plant. We, I know we said that they're synthetic, but they can actually technically pre, pre, be produced by a plant. By a plant, but they do treat all different types and not just uh, bacterial. But yeah, there's a lot of different ones as we'll go through here. So, uh, plants will protect themselves by producing compounds with an antimicrobial effect. Fruit and vegetables, um, as an example, so you have apple and spinach, which contain antibacterial and antifungal compounds. Herbs and spices, such as caraway and thyme, will have antibacterial, antifungal, and antiviral compounds. And then traditional medicines, such as St. George's wort, which is a plant, contains antibacterial and antifungal, while, quine, while, while quinine has antimalarial. Vaccinations, then, so you get different vaccinations as well that can cover for you this year. And the importance of vaccination in society is that it is eradicated diseases such as smallpox, measles, polio, rubella, tetanus, which is now uncommon in Britain. The vaccination will give you protection from diphtheria, tetanus, whooping cough, polio, meningitis, measles, mumps, rubella, and TB, like we just said. And the greater number of individuals that are immune, then there's a small probability that those, that those who are not immune will come into contact. This is known as herd immunity. The vaccination programs have caused infant mortality rates to plummet due to greater educational attainment and improved quality of family life, leading to vibrancy of the community. The economic benefits as well vaccinations is that there's a reduction of medical costs due to, and there's also fewer days off work, meaning there's improved productivity. You can also use antibodies to detect biomarkers. This is further uh, going a wee bit more about recovering pathogens and immunity, for an example. So monoclonal antibody is produced to bind to a single specific protein, as we know. This is used in a technique called immunoassay, which is used to detect the presence of a protein acting as a biomarker and is, and is associated with a medical condition. So for an example of this here is the diagnosis of a prostate cancer. They use this here without sticking the hand of the anus as well. That's only a normal way of testing it because this is not 100% accurate. But the diagnosis of the prostate gland. If the prostate gland is cancerous, then there will be a high level of the protein PSA. And this is tested for using monoclonal antibody enzyme, which is attached to allow the presence of the antibody to be detected. The test is called an ELISA test, otherwise known as enzyme-linked immunoabsorbent assay. So let's go through these steps now. So 
you'll have antibodies that are bound to a test place, so they'll literally be forced and bound. Then you'll add the patient's blood, and if there's PSA there, PSA antigen, it will bind to the antibody that is bound to the that is bound to the test plate. Then there will be an antibody with the enzyme added, so as we've seen, ELISA enzyme linked. So that then there will be an antibody with the enzyme. Okay, it will be added. Now this is separate after the blood. This is a different. Uh, uh, and this will be the same antibody, but with the enzyme added. And this will only bind to the first antibody if PSA is present. So basically, it will only bind to an, to an antibody that was bound to the test plate if PSA had binded to it. All the ones that PSA hadn't binded to it will be left there. So, okay, so once it is then binded when PSA is present, then you wash out the test plate and this will remove the unbound antibodies. So that leaves you with only the antibodies that have PSA bound to them and the enzyme that is bound to that. You'll then add a colorless substrate and the enzyme will convert the colorless substrate to a colored product. They can also be used in the detection of cytokines. The cytokines are small proteins which operate as molecular messengers between cells and are released by inflamed tissue. The edges of biomarker are often inflammatory conditions due to tissue injury and a bacterial infection. The ELISA test measures the level of cytokine in the blood. Thank you for watching this video on antibiotics, guys. We have now finished immunity, and I'll see you next time.